disappointment of the past, it's gone. The 45-year drought is over. The Los Angeles Kings are indeed the Kings of the National Hockey League. They are the 2012 Stanley Cup champions. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another post game live here on Dime Dropper for the 2023 24 season. Before we get started, you already know the drill. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube at Dime Dropper. And of course, you can follow, you can also listen to this episode on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And of course, hit the notification bell so you know every single time I post a video. And you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Dime Dropper Pod. So, as always, live from Los Angeles, Super Chats are turned on. If you want to drop a dollar or a dime, any donation is appreciated. we got a jam-packed schedule tonight, Los Angeles. Um, I wasn't able to watch the Laker game, though, against the Pacers. Again, of course, when I don't watch, they lose. Every time I watch, they win, it seems like, recently. So, I got to maybe just keep not watching. Uh, but I know my Laker fans wouldn't like that. But in all seriousness... I wasn't able to watch that game because I went out last night. Uh, so I didn't go out tonight, get to do this live. But the Laker game against the Pacers, you're going to have to wait on that. I'm probably just going to have to cover it on basketball and figure out with Edwin, which we're going to record on Monday and release on Tuesday afternoon. And then I'll be going live tomorrow because the Clippers and the Lakers are both playing on this East Coast trip. Clippers are playing Charlotte. Lakers are playing Brooklyn. So the schedule for this live is going to be Clippers Magic. And then we're going to go to the women's basketball games. I watched them both. They were I watched all the women's games today. They were super entertaining. Uh, UCLA versus LSU. Then we're going to go to USC against Baylor. And then we're going to end it off by a little bit of Caitlin Clark, as I watched that game too. And then we're going to end it off by looking at the Kings and the Dodgers situations. Because that's one thing I want to start doing a lot more is, even though I may not be able to analyze hockey, baseball, football, like I can do basketball, if I can just at least give updates on how I'm feeling about each team, it's good for looking at looking back at it in the future. And because, you know, I want to keep my audience updated. I want to, I do want to cover every single LA sport because you can find me at a game posting a vlog from any LA sports team. That's one of the reasons why this channel was made. I want to be an LA sports guy because there's nobody doing that. Everybody is LA sports for three sports. Then it gets to football and then we get a little bit uh, iffy. So I'm trying to be that dude. It's, it's I feel like it's a market that no one's touched. There's a lot of New York sports guys, Philly sports guys, even Atlanta, but LA, for whatever reason, we got so many transplants and so many people that just don't fuck with the home teams. So someone's got to be that. So let's get to the Clipper game. Hold on a second. I want to fix my lighting real quick. One sec, guys. Chelsea, I know, dude. All right, let's see what this does. Oh, okay. Let's see. Why is my nose so itchy? All right, let's see. Ah, okay. Much better. All right, let's get back to it. Hold on. Ready to lock in? You ready to lock in? Let's get it. Let's get some comments, y'all. Let's get some comments. All right, ready. All right, time to talk about the Clippers against the Orlando Magic. Now, of course, if you didn't check out my last live, we played against the Philadelphia 76ers. Go ahead and check that out. Big win for us just to beat a team that's, like, not actually, like, completely shitty because we've been really struggling against good teams lately. This was another test for us. Can we make it two in a row? Can we beat an Orlando Magic team that's young and athletic, has been playing? They are. They were on a two-game losing streak heading into this game, but second half of the season, they've been even better than the first half. So I was interested to see what we could do. And what I saw was a different level of seriousness and intensity defensively with the same nine guys, Mason Plumley, Amir Coffey, Norman Russ off the bench, and then PG, Kawhi, Zoo, Harden, and Terrence to start. Why is it that all of a sudden we can flip a switch defensively? You had to get your ass kicked a bunch of times to do that? Or you, I don't know, were extra rested? I don't know how when there's only one day between games and you guys are flying constantly. I'm very confused. But there could be a, a, a level of it being just, we got to dig deep. Our effort is not good enough. We are older. We're going to have to try even harder. I don't know because if if we hadn't slacked off, in my opinion, we still would be in the race for the one seed, but it is what it is. Let's talk about this game in particular. So the one thing about the Orlando magic, and if you go back to my lives where we talked about them early in the season and we, when we checked in on them in the midway point, 
put out the all-star break. I timestamped everything. So you can check what I said about every team in the league. They have a very good defense. They got great defensive personnel, a lot of size, a lot of length, but offensively, they're not great. Markel Fultz is definitely having a fall off year. Like last year, he was his best season of his career. And now he's averaging seven points and shooting putrid percentages. And we know that Suggs is still not the best shooter. And then Paolo Bencaro, he's not the best shooter yet either. He's improved, but there's not that many shooters on that team. I remember one time I checked Cole Anthony is Gary Harris can make the open three. But I remember one time I checked three point percentages and Wendell Carter was leading their team in three point percentage and he's their center. So right now it's Joe Ingles shooting 42%. He's always been able to shoot the three. Jalen Suggs is actually shooting 40% from three. So I stand corrected. He's really improved in that aspect. Damn, Jonathan Isaac shooting 40%. Okay. He only shoots two a game, but that's still impressive to me. Anthony Black, 39%. He didn't even play. Gary Harris, 37 and a half. Then Wendell Carter, 37. Yeah, Paolo's 35 and a half. Cole Anthony's 33. Mo Wagner's 32. Franz Wagner, 28 and a half. Mark Hilfold's nine. These guys all play. Those guys I just named, they all play minutes for them. So the spacing is not super great, but I like their defense and their athleticism. The thing is, apparently that's the best team that we've swept this year in the season series. And I can see why, even though we played them at two totally different parts of the season. That vlog is a very interesting one, by the way. If you check them at my channel, it was when we got James Harden. It's just labeled Clipper fan reacts. Clipper fans react to getting James Harden in game versus magic. I remember my feeling on the team, bro. My heart had just sunk. Like something had been taken out of me when we had been traded for Harden. But the reason why I think the magic don't match up great with us is because their two best players are like bigger wings. And so are ours. And ours are just more experienced and better. So to start this game, they had Jalen Suggs guarding Harden, Franz Wagner on Paul George, Paolo Bencaro on Kawhi, which is a great matchup, by the way, Wendell Carter on Zoo, and Gary Harris on Terrence. Then we rebuttaled with Kawhi on Paolo Bencaro, PG on Franz Wagner, Harden on Harris, Zoo on Wendell Carter, and Terrence on Suggs. Wendell was in drop coverage. And so was Zoo. Now, we were switching one through four. So we were okay switching hard on to Ben Caro. And I'm going to talk about that more later on in the episode. But they weren't okay switching Harris onto James Harden. I don't remember them, Kawhi or Paul, trying to put Gary Harris in the action. They may have. I just can't remember. But I remember James Harden specifically asking Terrence to come set a screen. And they didn't switch. Harris showed and then tried to recover. So that was interesting to me, but for the most part, they were, you know, switching everyone else. You know, they had no problem switching Franz on the James or Paolo on the James or Franz onto Kawhi, right? You know, et cetera. Even Jalen Suggs onto any of those guys. Cause he's been playing such great defense this whole season. Now, the one thing I wanted to talk about there is I've been challenging Kawhi and the Clipper coaching staff mainly to make Kawhi Leonard guard good players for more extended stretches because as I said, if Terrence Mann is your number one point of attack defender, I just don't think that's good enough at a championship level. I think he has to be one of the guys that guards good players, but not the sole guy that's taking the best assignment every game. It's just he's not that good of a defender to me. Kawhi Leonard has had to have a bigger defensive load since we got Harden, but I think that's one of the reasons that our team has dropped off. Not to say that Kawhi is not playing good defense, but I feel like he was – taking more minutes and possessions guarding elite players earlier on. And James Harden's offense allowed that. But we're going to need Kawhi Leonard to start being more ball dominant and shot heavy as this season winds down. And you saw a little bit of that in this game, which I loved, by the way. And at the same time, you're going to need more from him defensively. Like, it's just our ask of Kawhi is a lot, which we wanted and we knew and expected when we got him. But after getting James Harden, the fact that it's still this much is a little bit like, Huh. Interesting. Kawhi Leonard guarding Paolo Bencaro. Second straight game he has started off guarding the best part of the other team. The other day it was Maxi. This time it was Bencaro. Of course they're going to try to get the switch, but I just like that initiative. I just like that mindset from our team. Now, to start the game, James Harden made two shots. He had a three over Franz Wagner with a hand in his face, and he had a fall away against Jalen Suggs, snaking in the pick and roll. PG was missing good looks. Got some solid ones from all over the floor, except for in the paint. But clean looks at jumpers, 
throughout the game. There was one shot in the first quarter that pissed me off, and it would be the only shot that pissed me off throughout the game when he got Wendell Carter switched on to him, and he tried to tween cross pull instead of just trying to go downhill. That annoyed me. And Kawhi was a little quiet to start the game and then started getting going towards the end of the first quarter. Now, our defense was good right away, which was awesome to see. That We only allowed 19 points in the first quarter. Now, is that because of the Clippers' defense or the Magic not just great offensively? And, of course, the answer for any logical person is that it's a little bit of both. The Magic's offense is not great. You can go under the screen with Paolo Bencaro a lot. But And even Franz Wagner, when he's shooting 28.5% from three, the scouting report is going to say go underneath the screen. So they're not the toughest team in the world to defend. But what I liked, it was just a gritty game, you know, just not easy to get points from either team. And I like that we match their defensive intensity because if we don't, we still lose the game. And that's the biggest difference between these last two games and, and what was happening before. So I'm not going to say the Clippers are back, but we are starting to trend in what was good basketball direction. Now we have when we have nine games left. We've won the last two. Let's see what kind of streak we can build. We got Charlotte coming up on Sunday, tomorrow. So let's see what we can do. But it starts with our defensive focus. We only do have two bad defenders in the rotation, really. It's Harden and Norm Powell. Everybody else just has to be the best version of themselves, including Norman Powell and James Harden. And by the way, Norman Powell was not even bad defensively in, the, defensively in this game. I forgot to mention that on Locked On. I didn't talk about him enough on that episode, but – I try to keep all the all the uh, locked on episodes under 34 minutes. So if I really got a lot to say, sometimes it just doesn't make the make the cut. That's what we got Dime Dropper to give you the unedited, uncut, raw version. So let's see. First quarter stats. That's what I wanted to look up. Kawhi was two for four, only shot four times, four points, played the whole quarter as normal. Paul George. So it looks like going into the playoffs, we're going to be sticking with that. Kawhi plays the whole first and the whole third and then comes in after a couple minutes rest in the second, and we'll see how much rest it is in the fourth. Depending on situation, it might just be a minute or two. But again, I hope that having that much time in the fourth, it won't be an issue in the playoffs, but throughout regular seasons, it has been a big issue putting Kawhi in with six, seven minutes left when Paul George has already gotten a rhythm. He doesn't want to step on his toes, but we still don't get our best player going in the fourth quarter and then lose a game. That's happened throughout the last two years, a good amount. So... We'll see what happens in the playoffs. I think that he'll still probably get the first nine or 10 minutes of the fourth, which should be enough to get himself into a rhythm. But sometimes if he comes in at the 630 mark, doesn't shoot till 520, then doesn't shoot till three. Like, you know, this is not ideal for your best player in the final minute of a game or final quarter of a game. Anyway, yeah, as I said, Paul George missed some good looks. He was one for four in the first quarter. James Harden was actually two for three in the first five points. He would not hit another shot till the fourth quarter. <laughs> and I'll, I'll talk about James Harden in a second, but solid first quarter overall. James Harden was being more aggressive, which you which you like to see. I mean, the best version of James Harden this season has been when he is aggressive. Now, second quarter, I saw that the Clippers were showing a little more defensive discipline in the sense that we were not switching Norman Powell onto Paolo Bencaro. So we weren't just switching Norm onto anyone anymore. And I liked that decision. We were showing and recovering. For a second to start that second quarter, we went without 2-1-3. Went with James Harden, Russell Westbrook, Mason Plumley, Amir Coffey. And I forget the last player that was in. But the defense looked pretty good. The defense looked pretty good. I will tell you who was not good defensively, though, was Russell Westbrook not staying attached to his man, not fighting over screens, falling asleep off the ball. I know which, when Russell Westbrook comes to play and when he doesn't defensively, and it's, it was very evident. And there was one situation that actually made me so angry. And again, I love Russ. And I'm rooting for him so hard. But there was one moment in the second half I'm going to talk about, which honestly made me – I was contemplating posting it on Twitter, but I don't want to be that guy because I love Westbrook so much, and I don't want to put bad stuff in the air about him. But if that was James Harden, I would have posted that shit so fast. Are you kidding me? It was disgraceful, honestly. So, but Amir Coffey, actually Russell Westbrook, he had some good moments in the passing lanes. Let me see if he got a steal in the game. But that being said, doesn't mean he played good defense. 
In the first half, he was he was okay. Yeah, he got one steal. Yeah, that's not a big deal to me. Amir Coffey, though, was good on the ball and in the passing lanes. And I thought that Paul George defensively throughout the game, even though he was struggling with his shot, was pretty excellent. When he was called upon to play man defense, whether it was Paolo Ben Carroll or Franz, I thought he did a pretty good job. And he was active off the ball. Amir also was solid on the offensive end, knocking down open shots. And I, you'd like to see that in the last two games, start to get his shot back because he took a little bit of a dip when we were struggling as well. So it was good to see that he, he only shot four times in the game, but he made two of them. So you'll take that. And two for three from three. So big time. Six points for Amir, two rebounds in 19 minutes. But this is where it started to get really frustrating for me. James Harden, he was being aggressive, but he struggles massively to get good looks against good defenses. Mainly a good point of attack defender with a good drop big. It's he really struggles to create separation and turn the corner and yeah, create separation, whether he's one-on-one -on -one or turning the corner. Every good team knows now stay home on the shooters, make James play two on two with zoo or whatever big is in and try to get him to be in the in-between game. Cause he's not comfortable. And the only thing he does is that little stiff arm. So again, everything I was saying about James Harden before we got him, and what I was saying in the playoffs last year, why he didn't shoot many shots in some games, it's not that he was just being timid. He struggles to get good shots off because he has he does not embrace any post game at all. He does not start any of his moves inside the three-point line. He has no stop on a dime mid-range. He has no fall-away mid-range coming off screens. At least any, any of the stuff that he mentions, you could pull up one or two clips maybe throughout the last eight years that he's done that. It's not consistent, and the defense knows it. His shot diversity is very not diverse. It's the floater that he neglects now, a layup at the rim with the left hand usually going left, then the step back three. He doesn't take the open three a lot of times, and that allows the defense to recover. And his defense has fallen off a cliff. He was turning the ball over carelessly. This was every all the stuff I'm talking about with James Harden was what he was doing in this game all the way up to about. I want to say five minutes to go in the game. No, honestly, the last two minutes is when he's played well again with those two steals he had at the end. And he and I will say he definitely contributed to the win because those two steals that those were huge. But oh my god, man, it was it was painful. And then the the, the fucking dribbling, taking ten plus seconds off the clock. This is this is my nightmare. This is my nightmare. Even though we won the game, my nightmare is having to root for this. You guys know how I felt about this. And it's like, it's playing out in front of me and I have to root for it. And I just don't believe in it. I know he's going to fuck shit up. I know it. Maybe it's not going to be in the first round, but I just don't see us winning the chance. We have no shot of being Denver with him. I just, he's dribbling so much. He's not creating separation against good defense. And only in the playoffs, you don't play many bad defensive teams. We'll see. It's If he doesn't have his pick and roll, he's nothing. He's actually nothing. Westbrook got pulled out a little too early. He, in both, both halves, by the way, in my opinion. Yes, he was a little erratic. Yes, he's, you know, they sag off of him and it can hurt our offense at times. He was going, getting downhill. He's putting pressure on the defense. James Harden airballed three times in one game. And you know partially why? It's like he airballed easy shots. He can't get good looks off against these good defenses. He's slower now. He's older. We'll see if he can get back in his bag. I still think he's going to have some good games in the playoffs. It's not like he's going to shit the bed every game, but we'll see how far we can go and how well he plays. But I'm worried about us being too married to him. At least Westbrook, you know, he's not going to run out of gas in the fourth quarter. That's the one thing you're afraid of him having hitting the Jets too hard. But, oh, man, he wasn't even creating good looks in this game like that. He had four assists. He averages eight. He had four assists. Kawhi Leonard had five. Russell Westbrook had five in 18 minutes. Harden played over twice as many minutes, 37. Come on, dog. Second quarter. Let's see what else I have here. He was being aggressive, though, which I don't even know if I like. Mason Plumley. I thought he had a great first half. He was finishing around the basket on rolls, right place, right time around the basket, and also playing strong defense, as were everyone else for the most part. Norman Powell. 
There were times where he was just on bigger guys and just did a good job defending and standing strong. So even Brian Seaman talked about it a couple of times. He was in one-on-one -on -one situations and he held his ground. So and in addition to that, you know, turning the corner on these dribble handoffs, those that curl to his right, just so hard to stop. And he's the best on the team at attacking closeouts. And another thing that teams are starting to figure out about us is that you need to run us off the three-point line. We're a very efficient three-point shooting team, but especially James Harden and Kawhi and even Terrence Mann, their releases aren't fast. So when you get out to them, sometimes they second guess that quick catch and shoot three. And Terrence Mann's actually good at attacking that closeout, but Harden, he almost only tries to put the ball on the floor and then tries to step back almost every time. And then Kawhi, he just doesn't really hit the Jets after the pump fake very often. So teams know the closeout hard against us. And I'm starting to see that. So look for that going forward. Paul George is the one that's like, he's the most lethal. Because sometimes you can just close out. And if you're not, it's not, if it's not, if you're not right in his face, he's getting a clean look off. He's so tall. But we'll see how that translates into the playoffs. Uh, again, Kawhi, I'm not too worried about when it comes to any of these little things, because in the playoffs, he turns it up. But it was a good defensive battle. PG was guarding. And a lot of turnovers on both sides. The score was 52-50 at halftime. Now, I didn't like, as I said, I grilled hard in there because I thought we were too hard and centric in that first half. Kawhi Leonard, let's see how many shots he had in the first half. Oof. Eight. Okay, so he shot four shots in each quarter. He had 10 points at halftime. Paul George was one for six. James Harden was two for seven. Terrence Mann had five points in the first half, and I don't know if he scored the rest of the game. Yeah. He had five points in the first half, and he didn't get a shot off the rest of the game. Two for four from the field in the game for him. And he played just eight minutes in the second half. I don't know. We've been going away from Terrence in fourth quarters in favor of Amir. And I don't know if I really like that, to be honest. I'm not going to complain if we win, but I still trust Terrence a little bit more. Just his ability to attack closeouts and make big plays, whether it be offensive rebounds or a big cut. I don't know. It's my trust in him after that game six and this, that playoff run in general. But I'm always a fan of Amir Coffee doing well as well. Now, in the third quarter, one thing I loved, we started to go Kawhi-centric. Give Kawhi the ball, get out of the way. Kawhi Leonard statistically has the best points per possession of any isolation player in the league that gets two or more isolations in the league, I believe. And, I mean, he was getting us good looks. In the mid-range, you know what he does. You know what he does. And we went up 61-50. to 50. PG continued to get good looks, but he was bricking. Now, it wasn't just threes. Even though he wasn't getting any easy layups or anything in the paint, it wasn't just threes. He had good wide open 18 footers when bigs were in drop coverage coming off screens and he missed. He didn't take very bad shots in my opinion. Would I like to see him get the ball in the mid post more elbow P more? Absolutely. But it wasn't too bad. And at least he was still guarding one player who I thought was exceptional was if it's a all game. And it's really good to see Zoo starting to trend in the right direction, heading towards the playoffs, but I need to see more of this. He was doing a good job finishing around the basket. There were a couple times where he got smaller guys switched on to him, and he kept the ball high, Kevin McHale style, went right up over the top, whether it be Suggs or Gary Harris, and he was finishing around the basket when he was fed by other players, doing a good job protecting the rim, and he was rebounding. Zoo in this game, and we closed with him. Zoo in this game, 14 points. Nine rebounds, two assists, one block, just one turnover on seven for 10 shooting. No free throw attempts, but 70% from the field. You got to love that. Again, I'm going to say it over and over, especially when we struggle to get close shots around the basket or good shots around the basket. Feed the ball to Zoo in the post. It's an efficient play statistically, and it matches the eye test. He likes to post up on the left block. So feed him the ball on the left block so he can get to his right-hand jump hook. And here's why you definitely should do it now. He's put in the work to get a left hand now. He never had a left hand before this year. When you played him to, his, to spin over his right shoulder, he had nothing. This year he does, and we're not giving him the fucking ball. Because role players can't post up in today's NBA. It's not efficient. I mean, I can't stand it. I really can't. 
Let's stop being dumb. So James Harden was playing like dog shit, and the Magic went on a 9-0 run. PG was turning the ball over. Let's see the turnover count in the third quarter from us. Oh, my God. Five turnovers, two of them from Kawhi, two of them from Plumber Jim, and then one from Russ. Russ was just, again, a little bit out of control, going to the basket hard. He was two for six in the game, but I will say one of the misses was where he drew like two or three bodies and Mason Plumlee followed it up. So not all misses are created equal. I thought he was doing at least a decent job of getting downhill and feeding guys. That's why he had five assists in just 18 minutes of play. Three rebounds as well, two of them offensive, one steal, but he did have two turnovers. And here's the one I was going to talk about. God, this made me honestly go nuts. This dude was looking to throw a right-handed pass up the court and it like slipped out of his hands or something. And then he didn't pick up Jalen Suggs in transition. It was so wild. He was not talking. He's just roaming around looking clueless on D and they get a wide open dunk because Kawhi and Zoo had to guard three players. I was actually going to, I was fuming. I couldn't believe that. Russ, dude, you're not fooling anyone. I'm not going to post the play. Because I like Russ so much. But actually insane. You cannot be doing that. Especially when I'm trying to advocate for more minutes for you. But to end the quarter, I will say Kawhi Leonard was starting to find his three ball. And that's huge because he's been struggling from three lately. And I, a lot of it looked like his legs. There was one shot he took. It was so in rhythm and it looked so good because he just got more pop in his shot. And also... Second blow by from the top of the key this season from Kawhi Leonard. Yes, I said second. That's how little he's really been when he's facing up at the three, blowing by guys like that. It was against Paolo Bencaro. He hit a behind the back, got downhill, and got his only two free throws of the game. It was great to see that. And his defense was exceptional as well. It felt like every time the ball was in his vicinity, he was active and getting a hand on things. And when Kawhi's like that defensively, it's funny when people insult his off-ball defense because his off-ball defense is actually one of the best on our team. And I don't think Clipper fans insult his off-ball defense. I just see threads about, you know, in the past and how he was with San Antonio. And it's like he has not been the same on-ball defender that he was in San Antonio. But off-ball, he's had to learn to play that role more because he's been in that role more. And I think he's not bad at all. So we went into the... Fourth quarter, up by eight. The third quarter was actually our best. 33-27, to 27, we outscored them. The fourth quarter was a slugfest, as this game was for the entire thing. James Harden airballed again, and then Russ had a bad turnover. Oh, yeah, that was the one. That, yeah, it was in the fourth quarter, I believe. The bad turnover in the defense. But he was still attacking the rim, so I liked it. We took him out. PG came in for the final 10 minutes. So, again, non-2-1-3 minutes to begin that fourth quarter. And then Kawhi and Zoo for the final eight. I I don't know how to tell to tell you the truth. I was very nervous about Harden ending that game over Westbrook. Like very nervous. I thought Harden was playing terrible and he was hurting our team defensively. He wasn't doing much either at that point. We went. The Magic went on a thirteen to nothing run when they were down 81-89. We were turning the ball over and we were missing shots. And in both halves, to close it, we went with a lot of the Norm Powell, Harden, Paul, Kawhi, Zoo lineup, the Powell Rangers lineup, as the Clippers pod calls them, or the Clips and Dip pod calls them. And that is that has been statistically our best lineup this season. But I'm very scared of James Harden. And then at the end of the game, we were switching Harden onto Paolo. And a couple times, Paolo got favorable things. But there were also a couple times throughout the game where you know James is going to get those occasional hardened strips. And late in the game, and again, at this point, Paul George, let me check what he had in the third quarter. In the third, Harden was 0 for 2 with two turnovers in six minutes. So he only played half of it. And then Paul George was 0 for 1, three points, all of them at the foul line in nine minutes and 36 seconds of that third quarter. In the fourth, Terrence Mann only played five seconds. Russ only played a minute and 50 seconds. Mason Plumley played four minutes and five seconds. And here's the thing about Mason. I actually thought he had a great game, except for in the fourth quarter, uh, Mo Wagner was taking him to town, just going right at his chest and scoring. So it was, it was tough. It was tough. But I honestly thought Mason overall had a good game. Eight points, four boards, 
one turnover on four for six shooting in 13 minutes. I'll take that, to be honest. Amir Coffey got about the same amount of minutes in the fourth quarter, just four. He had six points in the game, two rebounds on two for four shooting. I already mentioned that. So I thought it was he was solid. But Norm, he was consistent throughout the game, as he always is. I think after Kawhi Leonard, he's our second most consistent player. He had 10 points on five for eight. in the corner and solid defense when called upon in 26 minutes. So good stuff from Norm overall. Paul George continued to miss, and then finally he got a layup. I was watching it with my dad, and I told him he's going to make his next shot. Because I know I've been in those situations when you're not making anything, you just see the ball go in, changes everything. He hits a right wing three. Uh, on the next possession, or on the next shot he takes. Basketball, man. Sometimes you can just tell things are going to happen. Kawhi Leonard hits a huge shot. Huge shot to give us the lead. I believe 96-95. Paolo Bencaro gets James Harden on the switch, goes into his chest, and scores. I talked about on the last live, I'm afraid of James Harden guarding these elite players in these situations. It, hopped, it worked in this game, but we'll see what happens at the highest level. He will still get his occasional steals. I will say that. But Palo and Carroll put the magic up one. Then we get Jalen Suggs switched on to Kawhi, and Kawhi gets within 15 to 12 feet for the turnaround shot. I think it was even closer, like 10 feet. Turns around over his right shoulder. Beautiful pivot. Great footwork. And here's my thing with Kawhi in closing. We've seen him in the 2021 regular season, those first two games against the Jazz in the playoffs. And then at times this season and last, he'll run out of gas at the end of games and look like he has no legs in his shot. And he'll start dribbling a shit ton and starting his moves from behind the three and not getting into his mid-range, 10-foot range where he's pretty automatic. Now, in this game, even though he was guarding good players and playing great defense, he somehow had this second wind. And mind you, he only sat like a couple of minutes of that fourth quarter. He was able to get in that mid-range area. And when he can get in that mid-range area, a lot of it's where he catches the ball. Then he can get, he's the number one option for the closing. I still think Kawhi is the closer, but I just said the last shot of the game, I want Paul George because he creates more separation and has a better, it seems like, not seems like he does get his shot off easier. He's just taller, more fluid, quicker. So that's my, for the last shot. I like Paul George, but Kawhi Leonard is the closer and he should be getting the ball in crunch time late in games. But I'm saying when it comes to that, I like him catching the ball closer and getting in that mid range. He hit the jumper to give us the lead. James Harden then gets a steal. The steal may have already come actually before that. He gets a steal on Paolo Bencaro on the switch the next time. Kawhi gives us the lead. Then he gets another steal with his hands up fundamentally with his back turned. And Paul George then isos against Jonathan Isaac at first. By the way, Zoo helped create that steal by deterring Paolo Bencaro at the rim. Paolo was thought twice about going up against him. So big time from Zoo. And I love that Ty is starting to trust Zoo more to close games. And then... PG going one-on-one -on -one with Jonathan Isaac and hitting that turnaround was unbelievable. But that's, that's the thing about Paul George. He can get a shot off over anyone. There's no good deep. There's no defense for when Paul's at his best. None. You know what I'm saying? So big time. And then Franz Wagner missed and we won the game 100 to 97. One of our best wins in a while and definitely encourages me going forward that we can finish the four seed, take some momentum into the playoffs and still make a run to the conference finals potentially. So, and we can have great memories and have fun on the channel. Championship, <laughs> you're not, I don't think we can win it, but let's read the lines for the guys that haven't read lines four. Already talked about Terrence, man. Five points on two for four shooting in 20 minutes. Again, I'm always wanting more Terrence minutes, but we'll see. Clippers got outscored, by the way, in that fourth, 20 to 15. The only guys I haven't read are Paul, Kawhi, James, and Zoo, but I'm going to go with the Magic guys for a second. Their bench guys got a decent amount of minutes. Caleb Houston. Got eight points on three for four shooting and two for three from deep. Fuck Joe Ingles. I can't stand him. Five points on two for five shooting and one for two from three in 19 minutes. Cole Anthony was three for 10. 
but he was two for five from three, eight points, three rebounds in 19 minutes. Mo Wagner, 12 and nine, nine rebounds, of course, off the bench on six for 10 shooting in 18 minutes. And Jonathan Isaac, three points, five boards, one assist, one steal, and two blocks. He was an exceptional defender on one for three shooting, one for two from three. Gary Harris, eight points, three for six on the field. I don't hear about Gary Harris at all anymore. Kind of crazy. He's been injured a lot the last couple of years. Wendell Carter only played 24 minutes. A lot of, yeah, only 24 minutes from him. Two points, five boards on one for three shooting and 0 for one from three. Jalen Suggs, 15 points, five assists, three steals, two blocks, two turnovers. That's a pretty well-rounded stat line. Six for 14 from the field and two for four from three. And then Franz Wagner, we kept him in check pretty well. 13 points, three boards, three assists, two steals and a block. On five for 13 shooting, 0 for three from deep, three for four from the foul line. And Palo and Carroll, 23 points, eight rebounds, seven turnovers. They had 14 turnovers. He had seven. Actually, no, they had 17 turnovers. Both teams did. But Palo was eight for 18 from the field, one for six from three. So again, you're going to see it in the playoffs. Teams are going to give them all the space in the world, and they're going to go under screens. The team shot 44% from the field, 34.5% from three. In the first half, they were shooting lights out from three. So they definitely cooled down, shot 73% from the line. The Clippers shot 48% from the field, but we didn't shoot well from three either, 33%, and we only got 24 off. And you're starting to see that recently because, as I said, teams know that we're not great attacking closeout. Now, last three guys, two I already mentioned them actually, but James Harden, 11 points, eight rebounds, four assists. Eight rebounds is good. I didn't notice one of them. Four assists, he's half his average. Four steals, I love that. Four turnovers. He has many assists, as turnovers. Three for 12 from the field, one for seven from three, four for five from the foul line. So he did get to the foul line a bit in 37 minutes. I'm terrified about the playoffs here. He's looking like Summer Jim. Paul George, 12 points, four rebounds, one assist, one steal, two turnovers. Seven of those 12 came in the fourth, which is great, but six points is not going to be good enough in the playoffs. Four for 14 from the field, one for five from three, three for three from the foul line, 35 minutes. Here's what I'll say about Paul. His process was not bad. He needs to still be more aggressive, mid-post P, elbow P, but his defense was still good. And that's, like to see. that's why he's better than James Harden to me because when Paul's locked in on defense, even his worst game, he's going to be fine. I genuinely don't think there's good defense from a good PG. The PG is all mental. James Harden, he can't create space against the defenders anymore like that. Consistently. And he's very one-dimensional in terms of just pick and roll. Everything else, he's not great at. Kawhi Leonard, our player of the game. He's starting to look like Kawhi Leonard, rounding into form. I'm so excited with how close we are. Nine games away. I'm still knocking on wood. We're so close to a healthy Kawhi, guys. My dream. We're not this guy. Healthy Kawhi in the playoffs. We're sold out for the super crowd. We know we'll be there no matter what. We're going to vlog on this channel for Kawhi's first game in front of the super crowd. crowd. Oh, my God. We are so close. I'm so knocked. Wow. 29 points. 11 rebounds. 5 assists. 4 steals. 2 blocks. 3 turnovers. You definitely want to see that number down. On 12 for 21 shooting, 3 for 6 from 3, 2 for 2 from the line in 38 minutes to lead the team in minutes, to lead the team in points, to lead the team in rebounds, tied for the lead in assists, the most steals on the team, the most blocks on the team, the most made shots on the team, the most shots attempted on the team, the most threes made on the team, and the most minutes played. Kawhi Leonard, this is what we're going to need, this kind of stuff. From our best player. Let's, some, let's just talk about some things that stand out to me from that stat line. Number one. Number one. 11 rebounds. The last two games, he's combined for 20 rebounds. 10 rebounds a game. He's playing a lot of power forward. He's playing as the low man. He needs, he's going to probably have to have these kind of numbers. Big rebound numbers. And you see that in the playoffs, Sean. Five assists, great stuff. How about four steals and two blocks? Active defensively, two-way player with 20-plus shots. That's the big one for me. I talked about that. He's only shot nine. He's only had nine games where he shot 20-plus times. 
make that 10. That we need him to continue to take 20 plus shots. And in the three for six on three is big 10 because he's been struggling from three. So we can make it three in a row easily against Charlotte. We got to get it done. But I'm very, very excited. Not very, very excited, but I'm looking, you know, we could be optimistic now. All right. Now it's time to talk about the women's, some of the women's games. And we're going to start with UCLA versus LSU. Now, this was a great game. I have to say, though, I woke up in the beginning of the fourth quarter. So my analysis won't be very extensive, sadly. But what a game it was. Two really talented teams going at it. Obviously, uh, you know, my dad went to UCLA. My sister went to UCLA. So I definitely root for UCLA, even though I have a great amount of respect for U, uh, for LSU and their team. One thing I noticed right away, though, Lauren Betts, her size was, you know, just jumped off the screen. We were getting some good looks, getting her the ball in the post. And then Angel Reese comes back in the game with four fouls. And I was very surprised that we didn't go back to Lauren Betts in the post, especially when Angel was guarding her with four fouls. The guards just tried to go at their guards, and LSU's tough in that department. It was that one time that Flage had that block, clean as a whistle, big-time block. And I was just like, man, why aren't we throwing Lauren the ball in the post? And I saw some people tweeting about the game and saying we were struggling to throw entry passes. And how many times have I said that over the course of this channel about the NBA players struggling to throw entry passes now? That's huge. This summer, UCLA ladies practicing entry passes all summer long. But that's disappointing because Lauren was a presence. We wanted to, we had to, you know, you got to try to attack Angel and get her in foul trouble. She's so effective on the roll and on the glass. And then, you know, Flage just had some huge shots, especially that scoop layup she made. And we were struggling to get good looks at the end of the game. And you saw that championship pedigree from LSU. They were there last year. And I, can I just say how awesome this is? I spent almost my entire Saturday watching women's basketball at the collegiate level, and I thought it was amazing. I had such a good time. And I've always been a women's basketball advocate, but I've never spent a whole day watching WNBA or – women's college you know I've, I've spent the whole day watching soccer and men's basketball but i've never done that before and i thought it was awesome so shout out to all the ladies that played today such high level hoops lsu here's my thing about lsu i was rooting for them last year in the final but here's my it, they've gotten so much hype now and, and warranted but man they just i didn't mind the boasting and the getting hyped because I'm, I'm such an advocate for getting hyped and getting and being emotional and, and pouring your soul out in the game and getting the crowd hyped. I'm all, I'm a huge fan of that because that's how I am. But when it's against your team, it stings so much. I'm like, Oh my God, like fucking angel Reese and Flage, like just get out of my face. Like just, it rubs salt in the wound, but much respect to them. If you want to get them to stop talking, you got to beat them. So Ugh, LSU moves on. And honestly, it's a better storyline, I guess. But Lauren Betts, 14 points, 17 rebounds, three assists, and four blocks on four for nine shooting. Again, you need to get that girl more than nine shot attempts. But granted, she got the ball. Uh, she got to the line 11 times, which was more than anyone in the game for both teams. And she went six for 11 at the line. So, you know, you shoot 12 for 18 at the foul line. And you missed five of the six free throws for the team. That's definitely something you got to reflect on. But she, to me, was the best player on the court for the for the Bruins. So it's tough. It's tough. And it was just a rough shooting game for UCLA. 36% from the field. 32, I'm sorry, 22% from three, 67 from the line. So they just kind of got clamped. But they shot 13 more field goals. LSU, though, shot 13 more free throws. And, you know, free throws are always easier. So. They ended up winning the game 78 to 69. It was a tie game going into the fourth, but they outscored us 30 to 21 in the fourth. So shout out to them. Angel Reese had a double double with 16 and 11, one assist, four steals, and two blocks, and no turnovers. Jesus Christ. Five for 12 from the field and six for seven from the foul line. And Morrow, Anisha Morrow, she 
had a solid game as well with 17 of her own on seven for 11 shooting. And then Flage, 24 points and 12 boards to go along with a steal and two blocks on seven for 11 shooting and eight for 10 from the foul line. She was tough. She was the player of the game, got the job done and set it up for a rematch against the Iowa Hawkeyes. I got to talk about that for a sec. So I watched the game, Iowa versus uh, Colorado. Caitlin Clark, she is like a mix between Steve Nash and Steph. She's got the uncanny off-ball ability and the quick trigger release and money from crazy range. And she has amazing passing ability that, to me, exceeds Steph Curry relative to his level of play. She is a dime dropper, certified. You heard it here first, Caitlin Clark, dime dropper certified. She is amazing. I mean, her off-ball movement, everything around that Iowa offense is centered around her. But, man, it feels like she can get him a good look every time down. And usually at the collegiate level, they always, you know, hedge and recover and pick and roll. But with Caitlin, it's like they're damn near blitzing her, getting the ball out of her hands any means necessary, and she still gets hers. And it's just it's amazing to watch the phenomenon that she is, and she carries herself with such professionalism at that age. You know, it feels like she's 24, 25 years old, but she's just a college student. It's really amazing to see. Also, shout-out to uh, Noah Vonley's sister. Um, what's her name? Aaronette Vonley. She was, you could, she looked so much like Noah. She was dominant in the post for stretches of the game. 13 points for her on six for nine shooting. Got some really good post position. Don't think they gave her the ball enough, but all Iowa starters in double figures. That was big time. Caitlin Clark had 29 and 15 assists and six rebounds. Like Anna Steele in a block on 13 for 22 shooting. She didn't shoot well from three though. Three for 11 but she was 10 for 11 from two. And she's just such a bucket. Indiana's going to be so lit next year. Unreal. Exceptional player. Enjoying the greatness for sure. But other great performances. A falter had a perfect game from the field. Six for six. 15 points and five rebounds. Gabby Marshall. She had a good game too. She only averages six points and she had 14. So Iowa. Iowa LSU rematch. Man, that's going to be must-see TV. We'll be watching that no matter what. And this is what's so amazing about the women's game and what they're doing so well with is you can't go one and done. So you're seeing these girls come back year after year, and they're building a legacy in college. They're building some continuity that fans can get attached to and say, oh, man, I'm excited for them to come back next year. Whereas in the men's game, you got all these one and duns. It's a new player. It's a new t- brand new team at the Blue Bloods and these high-level schools. It's just not the same. The women's game is in the best place it's ever been. Most A lot of people these days say both men's and women's are at the best it's ever been. I, I big-time disagree with the men's. I think the regular season is garbage. But it was better this year than any year of the dime dropper era. I will say that. But I don't think the men's is a good product. Everybody knows that. I just have to keep it under wraps for now because I'm a locked-on host and I'm technically covering the league. But when Oh, man, I'm going to shit on that. At one point. Anyway, the women's game, though, it's better than it's ever been. No doubt about it. It's just in such a great place. And I can see the vi- I can see what these ESPN is doing. Every star player in each game, Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, Juju, who I'm going to talk about next, Paige, they're spamming. Like, they're just saying their name every minute. And I don't blame them because – the men's game has become a you know billion dollar business because of advertising guys like MJ and Kobe and LeBron and Steph. The women's game is trying to do the same with Caitlin, with Angel. And like all this publicity before you even enter the NBA is amazing. Like this is great. So I can't wait for Iowa LSU, but let's talk about the real deal. Oh, man. You know, everybody's going to be wondering, how the hell do you support USC and UCLA? I don't know. Just ask my dad and my sister because they went to both schools. So I just did what my dad was doing, which a lot of kids do. My dad's rooting for USC. My dad was going to USC when I was seven. So to me, USC is number one. I love UCLA, but I don't really root for them outside of basketball. Actually, no, that's not true. I like I root for UCLA in everything except for football. I just don't really – I'm just such a – I'm big on USC college football. Like that's the I ride or die with them. Even though 
I've not been a great USC fan in the post Pete Carroll era, but I'm USC over everything except for UMass in sports or Pepperdine basketball. That's different because they've employed me and my mom went there. So they get the tiebreaker, but USC, I'm like, that's, that's my shit. Especially USC women's basketball, the women of Troy. Are you kidding me? Cheryl Miller, the goat, the McGee sisters. I went to UMass um, for anybody wondering and CSUN for one year. So here's my, my school that I'm affiliated with, right? My parents. Um, I only stop as far as my parents, really. If my uncle went there, I mean, I'm kind of sympathetic, but it's not the same because I've been rooting for them since I was a kid. So my mom, the only school that she went to that's like a D1 school was Pepperdine, right? So my dad, so I have always rooted for the Waves. Now I root, work for them part-time or occasionally. And then my dad went to CSUN undergrad, UCLA graduate, and then he went to change like his type of profession. So he went to USC for two years while I was alive. So I was at his graduation. And that was when we had Reggie Bush, Matt Leinert, Dwayne Jarrett, Lindell White, Pete Carroll. I, I fell in love with the Trojans before I fell in love with the uh, Clippers, believe it or not. That USC football, I didn't even know all the rules of football. I didn't even know what a first down was. But Reggie Bush, I knew what he was doing in the end zone. I mean, it was just cinema. And then I cried my eyes out when we lost to Texas in a game I'll never, ever talk about ever again. Um, yeah, but anyway, so USC basketball, I don't think that USC women this season, no offense to the women of Troy, but Oh, I wasn't done naming legends, by the way. Uh, the McGee sisters, Tina Thompson, who I met by the way, legend, Lisa Leslie, my favorite women's basketball player of all time. But now we have a, a girl that might end up being my goat, my new goat. Because Candace Parker, she didn't play for the Sparks forever. Lisa Leslie, she's local. She went to USC. She's just the GOAT. But I didn't get to watch Lisa Leslie win titles in, the, in 2001 and 2002. Juju Watkins is a superstar. Let, let's talk about I don't think I've addressed the actual Juju Watkins phenomenon properly on this show yet. So, Juju Watkins. I went to the game again with Bronny's first game, right? If you guys have not checked that vlog out, you're crazy. Because I was like in the 10th row for Bronny's first game. After I left, there was a line stretching around the block outside the Galen Center because of Juju. I wanted to stay, but I didn't. You know, I was a, I was taking my, my boy TC took me to the game. And I don't think we had planned to stay, but we wanted to, we, sh we definitely got to see Juju next year. But I could see the hype right away. And this is non-conference play. Then I started getting to watch Juju play. And man, I'll tell you, she reminds me a lot in her own way of Shea Gilgis Alexander. And here's why I say that. She's not the fastest. She's not the quickest. But she's got a really good handle. She has a great change of pace. Really good footwork. Counters to whatever she sees. She's a big guard. Like, I don't even know. Is she listed as a guard? Because she's like 6'2". She's got great size. I mean, let's see what she's listed as. Yeah, she's listed as a guard. So there you go. And she's so good at getting to the foul line. It reminds me a lot of SGA. And she's very comfortable in the mid-range. I'm just such a huge fan of her game. And the composure and confidence that she has as an 18-year-old is insane. You know what's crazy to me? I am a fan of a player who I'm saying might be my GOAT. And she was born in 2005. You know how weird that is for me? I'm like, every when I heard, when I hear anyone say I was born in 2005, I'm like, oh my God, you're so young. Like 2005 is crazy. And she's cute. And that's not weird for me to say that because she's 18. She's like pretty. And she's so good. It's kind of insane. 2005, I'm getting old. And I don't mean like old, old, but it's like crazy. Just like life, the way I, yeah. You guys know what I mean. It's insane. I'm rooting because when growing up, you know, you look up to these college athletes. And then I got to the point where I'm the same age as the college athletes. And now it's like I'm a fan of an 18-year-old girl that went to Windward and Sierra Canyon. But that's what makes her so special because she's a local kid. Windward. You know, my ex went to Windward. Sierra Canyon. We just gave him the business twice in basketball. My team. My school team that I coached. Juju Watkins, and she's going to USC, my dad's school, and my sister's now. What a legend. So let's talk about the game, right? The coverages that Baylor was throwing at Juju, oh, my God. You know, constantly loading up. 
hedging and recovering, trying to make someone else beat them. And the thing about Juju that I love is she got her shot attempts up. In do or die basketball, you need to get empty the fucking clip. Get your shots up. Because the one thing you don't want to do as a number one option is step off that court and say, man, I was too passive. I didn't shoot enough. Go get it. And if you lose and it falls on you, that's the way it is. Because that's, at the end of the day, they're going to blame you anyway. <laughs> so I thought that Baylor, I want to give them so much credit. Like the, the way they were guarding, so physical, trying to take everything away from Juju, trying to force her to her left hand. And offensively, the amount of pressure they were putting on us, going straight into players' chests, going to the basket, especially in the second half when they were hitting all those threes, it was because they were getting in the paint every time. And that does not let defenders off the hook. You have to guard. There was one time where I think Juju either fouled or got a block, but she hit the deck so hard. And like these kind of plays where you're going right to the basket, right at the defender, it puts pressure on the defense. So it was becoming hard for us. And how tough they were playing Juju, she was missing a lot of shots. They were, and, and a lot of them were tough shots. It wasn't like she was getting a bunch of easy looks. And you also just start to see why I don't think USC is going to go all the way because I, I think they lack shot creation outside of Juju to win the whole thing, you know, compared to a team like LSU or South Carolina. But, I mean, I think Juju will have better shooting games than that. I think one of the biggest reasons that we were able to stay in the game was Mackenzie Forbes. I mean, she's been playing at a really high level lately. It's sad that she's going to be on her way out after this season. But especially that transition three she hit. You know, she is, she's got great size and has a handle and a bag. Like, she's good. She can really get buckets. I hope she goes to the WNBA. She should. I mean, she's on the number one seed uh, in a region, so I'd hope so. And she, she was averaging 20-plus the last two games. She had 14 in this game on 5 for 12 shooting and 2 for 2 from 3. I, I have to watch her more to see how much self-creation she has in her game in terms of, like, creating for the team. But she definitely has a one-on-one -on -one ISO package. But other than that, you know, I thought – Padilla had some some big buckets. She had she was three for six, eight points. Mar Marshall was a beast, though. What's her name? What's her first name? Raya Marshall. She was a beast. I'm happy that she's probably gonna come back next year. I'd hope. Ten and ten on the season, and in this game, a double double again. Eleven and sixteen. And I forget was it her or was it Kate? I think it was Caitlin Davis doing two for that jump hook late in the game, but. Again, I just thought that we struggled to get good shots throughout the game. We shot 39%. Baylor shot 39% as well. They shot 35% from three. We shot 29% from three. Five for 17. But we got nine more free throw attempts. Baylor shot 58% from the line. We shot 81% from the line. So getting to the line, that's huge. And here's the crazy part. And I don't know if any Baylor fans are complaining about this, but I bet they are. Juju shot more free throws than their whole team. Juju shot 13. They shot 12 as a team. And they went 7 for 12 from the line. So if they want to look at one of the reasons they lost, you got to make your free throws. You got to make your free throws. And it's funny, Sarah Andrews, who was making every three. I mean, she ended up 5 for 13 from three, but it was feeling like she couldn't miss for a while. She was 0 for 2 from the foul line. And that would have helped. And we were down 4 going into the fourth. And we won the fourth quarter 21 to 13. And despite how cold she was the whole game. Juju Watkins turned up in the fourth. Started with the and one. And also she wasn't, she did not stop guarding. Active hands, creating some turnovers. Let's see, she had four blocks, one steal. How about that? And there was one time where she caught the ball, drove, dished it off and got an assist. You started to see more aggression from her, start to get fouled. That and one that put us up 66-64 was absolutely huge. So you saw that, those big plays, big free throws as well, just continuing to be aggressive, getting to the line. And that's one thing I love about Juju. Just like SGA, she does not let the defense off the hook much. And she plays at her own pace. So it became a free throw game. And I thought that we did a very good job towards the end of defending. And that shot that Sarah Andrew shot at the end was a tough one. And we got the job done. And we're still dancing, baby. Woo! How about that? Juju Watkins, absolute star. I don't give a fuck what you're about to say about she shot eight for 28 from the field. We got the job done. Empty the clip. And that's what she did.
You got to get the job done. It's all about the win. It's all about the win. That's the only stat we care about over here. 30 points. However you can get it, you got to go get it. 30 points, six rebounds, four assists, one steal, four blocks on eight for 28 shooting and two for 11 from three, 12 for 13 from the line. Here's what I got to say. I don't know if we're going to go. I think we're actually going to beat UConn. I saw them playing. They weren't that impressive, but they guarded. I think we're going to beat UConn. I think Juju will have a better game. I don't know if we're going to win the, in the final four. But getting to the final four will be huge. And I just got to say, USC women in the Elite Eight for the first time in my life. I haven't gone there since 94 with Lisa Leslie. First time in my life. Juju has a legit potential to be my favorite women's basketball player ever. But I also am a Sparks fan. That's the thing. If she doesn't end up on the Sparks, it's going to be tough. I'm always going to root for her. But... We'll see if the Sparks get somebody I end up liking from the beginning to end. Because I'm, I'm really starting to get more into the women's game, and I really want to get more into the Sparks, especially with Edwin and doing Bass on Figueroa. So I'm very excited about the draft. The fact, we have two top five picks. It seems like we're going to get Cam Brink. She's beautiful, and she's a green protector. <laughs> Listen to the way I'm talking. This is it's so funny. I got to do the women's game. There's so much banter to be had. But nowadays, you can't say anything about the way women look and, and unless, you know, even if it's good, you're just going to get judged. So I don't know. I don't think so, though. Not when we're talking about hoops. But I think USC can win. I'm just so excited. Like, we, we got to the Elite Eight. I was shitting bricks at the end of that game. Like, it reminded me of when we had Jordan McLaughlin and that team with, with Benny Boatwright and Shemezi Metu, USC men. I was getting so nervous in the tournament. First time the women of Troy have made it to the Elite Eight in my life. So lit. Like, to follow somebody, not only a local kid. That's the one thing I love about Lisa Leslie. She's local. But I just didn't get to watch her like that. I love Candace Parker. She was my GOAT for a while. Then she went to the Chicago Sky. So I still fuck with Candace, but not as much as Lisa, the GOAT. But Juju is the new GOAT. Juju on that beat, baby. Juju Smith-Schuster. We don't even remember him at USC anymore. Juju Watkins, absolute legend. Winward and Sierra Canyon. I mean, it doesn't get more local. Anyway, let's finish off by talking about the Kings. So I don't have much to say about the LA Kings, but we're clinging on to that final playoff spot, that wild card spot. I watched our game tonight against the Flames. I think I'm going to be going to a Kings game very soon. Um, would you guys, I'm trying to definitely go to a playoff game. And I think we're going to get that eight seed or seven seed, that wild card spot. We haven't had home, home ice in a while, but how would you like to see a Kings vlog or Kings playoff vlog on this channel? We haven't had a Kings vlog on this channel yet. because The last game I went to was pre COVID. So that's pre dive dropper. That would be great, right? I can't believe we haven't had a Kings vlog on this channel. We've had plenty of Dodger vlogs. We've had LAFC. We've had the Rams, but we have not had um, – what was I – what did I just say? Kings. Go Kings, go. I'm just as big of a Kings fan as I'm a Rams and Dodger fan. I love the Kings. They're the only LA team of mine that I've actually seen win a real title in my life besides the Lakers, teams that I actually support. Oh, no, the Rams won a Super Bowl. What am I saying? Yeah, I'm sorry. The Dodgers one was great, but it's an asterisk. That was big time, though, the, the uh, Rams Super Bowl. That was my favorite, honestly, my favorite title of all my teams. Even more than all the Chelsea Champions League, uh, Premier League, that, 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 and the Kings ones. That Rams Super Bowl, oh, my God, it was special. I mean, that was, you got, that was, those videos need way more views. I can't believe you guys didn't watch those. I know you guys aren't football fans, but, like, me celebrating a title. Like, just think about that. Go check them out. There's a playlist for these things. Anyway, last edit, bit of business. The Dodgers. So I've been making an effort this season, especially with the Clippers being so unenjoyable for me with James Harden on the team. I am making more of an effort to watch the Dodgers and from the beginning and really pay attention. And so Yoshinobu, what's his name? Yamamoto, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. He got lit the fuck up against the Padres in that, uh, you know, those games in Japan. But he started tonight, and he was fantastic. And it was his first game at Dodger Stadium. Before I get into that, actually, I want to talk about just the games in the beginning. So we beat the Padres once and lost them once in the, in the Japan games. One game, Tyler Glass now pitched great. The other one was Yamamoto, who pitched like shit. We have our series against the Cardinals that we just had, and there's one more game that's happening on Sunday, but we won the first two and then lost the, the one tonight. The first one, I kept up with it, 
And, you know, one thing about the Dodgers, that top of our order with Mookie, Shohei, and Freddie Freeman, and then Will Smith is going to, like, fuck some teams up so bad this year in the regular season. The thing about it is I'm not going to go super crazy about our bats in the regular season because the last two years, that's all we've heard. We've been a top five offense in terms of runs and, um, yeah, just runs scored. And I'm pretty sure – I don't know about batting average. I think just runs scored. But second – we were first in the league in 2022 and they were saying we had a historic offense and then we completely choked in the playoffs and Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts are a huge part of that, especially these last two seasons. So I'm not going to get too excited about the Dodgers in the regular season, but it's, I'm just going to keep up with it. And the pitching, that's the one thing I'm looking at more because our starting pitching last season, we had Clayton Kershaw starting game one of the playoffs. That vlog, by the way, is on my channel and he got lit up. We can't have that, that obviously showed we were not going to win the world series last year. So our starting pitching, Obviously, we don't have Otani this year, but we still have Tyler Glass now. And like, I can't wait till Walker Bueller comes back. And then Bobby Miller, another year of development. So it's going to be better than last year. I can promise you that. Won seven to one that first game. Uh, Freddie Freeman had a good one. Mookie Betts, he has started the season in electric fashion, but we got a seven to one win on opening day. Then we had the next game where Bobby Miller was pitching, I believe. Yeah, he was. He got the win. Only had two hits. Zero earned runs. Zero earned runs. So Glasnow, who also pitched great again in the second game. So I'm loving Glasnow so far with a capital L-A. Bobby Miller also pitched well. So the last three games, our starting pitchers have been great, which is great to see. So we won that second game 6-3. to three. Look. Will Smith is off to a great start this season, but Mookie Betts, I mean, remember, he was an MVP consideration all of last year, right? I'm pretty sure Acuna won, right? Let's see. Did Acuna win? But anyway, Mookie Betts has four home runs in, yeah, he was the MVP in 2023. Last year, I'm pretty sure Mookie was the runner-up. Mookie Betts has four home runs in five games already. He's off to a crazy start to this season, which is awesome to see. And Will Smith is batting. <laughs> Will Smith is batting. Where was he? Gotta go to our averages. Will Smith is batting 455 right now. He's on fire. He had 10 hits. 10 hits so far. Freddie Freeman off to a pretty good start as well. Otani, he's a little behind. Uh, only batting 273 right now. But again, everyone's like freaking out. It's game five. We have 157 games left. Calm down. Teo Oscar Hernandez, uh, obviously a new Dodger. But that it was a good to see him have that game he had uh, yesterday with those two home runs. So our offense, I'm not really worried about it. This game tonight was interesting because Yamamoto had a great game. And then Joe Kelly allowed five runs, which I love Joe Kelly. That was sketchy our relief pitching we'll see how that is as the season goes on but then um what's what's the guy's name that came in at the end turn was his name he did a pretty good job it was amazing how we almost rallied and won that game mookie betts got the momentum going then we had freddie freeman and will smith hit those singles and then brass muncie drove in that run tail oscott he had a chance to win it and then shohei had the bases loaded I don't know how I feel about that second base rule, by the way, that they've implemented since 2020, where they start a runner on second base to start extra innings. But Shohei had a chance to, oh my God, have such a moment. Base is loaded with the game on the line, and he flew out. So, or, yeah, or popped out, whatever. I'm not as good with the baseball terminology, but tough to lose that one. Six to five, Hurt. What is his name? Kurt Hurt? Kyle Hurt. So he was pretty good. When he played, uh, this is he only played one game last year, so from the minor leagues. I like him, go off to a decent start. So, Dodgers will be fine. I just wanted to give him a, a checkup on them. So, excited for the season. But that's it for me in this one one hour and 10 minutes worth of LA sports. And guess what? We're back tomorrow for Clippers, Hornets, Lakers, Nets. Now, to the live subscribers, wait patiently in the chat. Super chats are turned on. If you want to drop a dollar a dime, peace. Wow, guys, talk about a lengthy live. Bones got busy. Go Tigers. Are you at, are you do you live in Louisiana? You just like them? That's a little suspect. Let's see. Bones. We got who else we got in here? Stratos. Let's go down Stratos. He says Clippers are number one. I tell you why. 
Yo, what's up, Daniel Berry? Dodgers lost, shaking my head. Juden Bug says, let's go. Bets MVP, though. Clippers picking it up. Kawhi. KB Magic. We beat the Magic, so it's fitting, fitting that you were in here. What's well, good? Chelsea are in shambles, man. I know. June, ba ju June Bug. Stratos says, we won with mostly Kawhi endgame heroics. What I'm still worried about is Harden has fallen off offensively, so he isn't controlling the offense the way he used to. What's up, Big Baby? He says, hey, hit the like button and subscribe. What's up? Everybody go subscribe to Big Baby's channel as well. He's got a good thing going on over there. Had Genie Bus on the show. Kyle's Takes, the legend, one of my mods. What's going on? Says, what's up? Yo, Big Baby Sports, what's up? Kawhi been playing more of the fourth the last two games. Yes, he has. Renzo the Gamer. By the way, if you guys are on Twitter, please let me know. Put your handles in there in the comments because I can give you a shout out. It says, seeing Harden and PG have bad games just gives me a laugh at this point. Like, come on, what's going on with this team? I don't think PG had a terrible game. I thought he just shot badly. I'm not into women's sports, but I heard Caitlin and Angel coming into the pros is like women's version of Magic and Bird. No offense to Angel Reese, but I think she's a great player. But I think that's giving her a little too much credit. I think Caitlin is transcendent. I think Angel's a very good player. I think she's been huge for the game's growth in that rivalry, but Magic and Bird is like a comparison about who is better. Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark, like Caitlin Clark's just better to me. Gurjet Singh, ref helped Clippers all day long. Interesting. Kelly should have had two periods at the end of the game. Who the hell is Kelly? Kelly who? Kelly who? Westbrook literally has the basketball intelligence of a high school player, but amazing athleticism. That's a little harsh. My prediction is the Mavs, Clippers first round, Mavs in five. Jesus Christ. Why do you hate the Clippers so much? Yeah, we get it. You're a Clipper hater. Hi, Jimmy. Not hate. I'm just realistic. That's not realistic. Russ is just better than Harden, I think. I don't know about that. Oh, Andrew Kassar. What's up, Andrew Kassar? Let's get you in there. Are you on Twitter, Jimmy G? Time if Harden wins finals MVP, will you regret all this? Of course. If, you, if we get to the conference finals, I'll regret a lot. Seriously, I will. Because if we get back to the second round, I'll, I'll like Harden. Because we've only made it to the conference finals once. <laughs> 